Hello and welcome to a special series of pathology podcasts celebrating the second National Pathology Week held by the Royal College of Pathologists. I'm Ben Valsler from thenakedscientists.com and in these podcasts I'll bring you some of the highlights of Pathology Week along with interviews to explain more about the importance of pathology in society. This year's events focused on pathology, the heart of modern healthcare and considered many different aspects that affect our understanding of the heart. In this series of podcasts, we'll be discussing how thinking about heart problems could save a baby's life, looking at the process of a heart transplant, the heart in art, the ethics of heart surgery and the anatomy of a heart attack. In this podcast, we're considering how an awareness of heart problems could make the difference between life and death for newborn and very young babies. So why could thinking heart help to save a baby's life. Dr Susie Lishman explains more. Today's event was looking at disorders of the heart that affect very young babies. These disorders are things that, if they're picked up early, can be completely cured and the babies can have normal lives, but if they're missed, and they're quite easy to miss, um, then they can have very life-threatening consequences. And what sort of disorders were we talking about? Today we were looking at three main types of disorders. The first is called duct-dependent lesions, which is all things that happen when the fetal circulation changes from being in the womb where the mother does the breathing to when the baby is born and then the lungs have to start breathing for it. And so there are changes in the circulation that take place at that time and if they don't happen quite correctly, then you can get abnormalities with the baby. The second was myocarditis, that's inflammation of the heart, and it's an infection, but it has very non-specific presentation, so the baby may be sleeping a lot or off their food. Very difficult um, to distinguish that from other less serious infections. And the third was arrhythmia, where the heart just isn't beating properly, maybe it's beating too quickly or too slowly. And the baby's heart really needs to beat at a, a constant standard rate to get the blood round. So we just learned about these three different conditions that can present within the first week or so of life and learned some of the things to look out for in the hope we can spot them before they cause problems. What role would pathologists play in identifying these diseases? Yes, well, that's a good question because you may think, well, none of this sounds like pathology at all. But in fact, making the diagnosis and particularly treating babies with these disorders involves a lot of pathology. Some of them may be picked up on blood tests, for example, if the kidneys aren't working properly, some of the chemicals in the blood may build up. If the liver isn't working, similarly, you may get abnormal tests. But also you can do tests for infection to see... Uh, in myocarditis to find out what organism it is that's causing the infection and then pathologists will identify that organism and find an antibiotic that hopefully will kill it off if it's a bacterial infection. But lots of blood tests just to really monitor how all the baby's organs are working and that's really where pathology comes in. That was histopathologist Dr Susie Lishman explaining the heart conditions that we'll be thinking about today and they are duct-dependent lesion, myocarditis and arrhythmia and the role that pathology plays in diagnosing and treating them. To explain more about duct-dependent lesions, I spoke to Dr Joan LaRouvere, Director of the Paediatric Intensive Care Unit at the Royal Brompton Hospital. When the baby's inside the the mum's tummy, it's a circulation that's different than what the baby has when he or she is born. There's something called the arterial duct that communicates between the two great arteries coming off the heart, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And it allows circulation in the baby because the baby's blood will bypass the lungs. The blood is oxygenated by the mum's placenta. When the baby is born, normally the duct will close because blood now flows to the lungs to receive its oxygen. In certain lesions of the heart, what we call right-sided lesions where the outflow to the pulmonary artery is blocked. The duct needs to remain open in order for the baby's blood to pick up oxygen. And likewise, for left-sided obstructive lesions, such as coarctation of the aorta, for example, when the duct closes, there's no way for oxygenated blood to get out of the heart and go to the body. We have drugs which can keep that duct open, until which time a baby can reach a cardiac center where they can have the necessary surgical or catheter procedures. 
to keep them alive and provide oxygenated blood to the body. But if we don't know about that, it wasn't diagnosed fetally, for example, and no one recognized the signs and symptoms of it early enough, these babies risk dying at home when that duct closes. How do you diagnose something like this before birth? Uh, In terms of diagnosing this before birth, it's on the ultrasound scan with adequate pictures from a, a trained person. You can diagnose many of these cardiac conditions. At the moment, the fetal detection rate varies anywhere from 10 to 40 or 50 percent, depending upon what area of the country you're in. And the national average is about 30 percent. So unfortunately, about 70 percent of cardiac babies, the diagnosis is not known about before they're born. So I think one important Uh, message to come out of today is that we need to develop a better screening system and better training of those who are imaging the heart of the baby when it's still in mom's tummy to be able to really diagnose this. And those 70% who don't get caught, what are the symptoms after birth? Well, it can, be, it can be subtle. I think that's what, what can make it challenging. And it can be evolving, depending upon how patent, how open that duct is. Generally, you will start to see some signs within the baby of maybe a faster heart rate, a faster breathing rate, perfusion to their, their extremities isn't so good, so you might notice that the hands and feet or arms and legs are a bit cool. Their feeding may have gone off, their energy levels, they're a bit more lethargic, and uh, they also may appear to have changed in color and to be more, more blue. But because these things can be gradual, it can often be missed if someone's just looking at a baby, which is why it's so important to have somebody who can examine them. So if people do start to notice any of these symptoms, of course they should get to a hospital or speak to a midwife as soon as they can. Yes, I think for parents, and one of the messages we've really heard from today, is that the mothers who have spoken all knew there was something wrong. Their baby was sleeping more than it should, or the color didn't look right, or wasn't feeding quite the right way. And these were mothers who had had previous children, so they knew something wasn't right. And I think it's really for us, the medical, nursing, and midwife profession, to really listen to those concerns and really look at the baby, examine them, and look for signs of any underlying reason that the mum's have this suspicion or that things clinically just don't seem quite right. And how common is it that we will have these duct-specific lesions? In the UK last year, there was approximately 800,000 babies born. And one in 145 babies will have congenital heart disease. So that means approximately 5,500 babies last year were born with congenital cardiac lesions. If 30% of those are diagnosed while still in the mum's tummy, that still leaves us with 4,000 babies out there who aren't diagnosed. Now, a percentage of those will have cardiac problems that may improve on their own with time or may require later intervention and not be quite so serious. But a large portion of those are presenting with a duct-dependent lesion, and it's a life-threatening lesion if it's not caught in the first few days or weeks of life. So the prognosis, if not caught early, is very poor. And sadly, this was the case for Amberly Hanrahan, who passed away October the 8th, 2008, from coarctation of the aorta. I spoke to Louise Hanrahan, Amberly's mother. Firstly, I want to say my story is how it was in my eyes. Amberly was born the 29th of September, 4.44am, Monday morning. Amberly gave me a perfect pregnancy as I'm a third-time mum, and my first-time pregnancy has resulted in a few problems. But I have Kitty, who is six this month, and Alfie, who was two in July. Before leaving the hospital, Amberly had all the regular checks. I was in no rush. So when the paediatrician came to us and Amberly and asked us if we had any concerns, I asked why Amberly was so red. And with this, the paediatrician carried out a blood test. We waited for the results, confirming all was okay, and we left the hospital and went home. Six days passed. Time with Amberly was wonderful. You see, she had an amazing aura for a child. Even my husband took her out of the crib in the week. He's normally a leave-it-all-up-to-mum type of dad. 
But he placed her on the bed and said, Wow, she's really special. I agreed. Well, of course all our children are special, but this was something else. Now on the seventh day, Sunday, I began to feel uncomfortable. I get like this when my husband travels and he was off to South Africa this day. But again, this feeling was different. My husband left for South Africa and I was then at home with the kids and my mother-in-law. On Monday, I remember saying to my mother-in-law, do you think Hambly is all right? My mother-in-law said, yeah, she's lovely, Lou. On Monday evening, I went to bed with the kids early. My mother-in-law stayed downstairs. I was up again in the middle of the night feeding Amberley. Now, Amberley never really settled in her crib like my other two children. Therefore, she spent a lot of time on my chest. After the feed, Amberley lay on the bed and wasn't settling in very well. You know, I know it could be wind, but for that moment, my heart dropped to my stomach and I remember it was about 3 a.m. I was about to walk out the room and get my mother-in-law. But Amberley lay on the bed, filled her nappy, and it almost looked like she smiled at me. Amberley reassured me, and I never took her anywhere that night, but that was not a nice feeling. On Tuesday, I felt anxious. I sat there in the morning thinking, oh, something's not quite right. I called the midwife. I think I left a message, so I called my GP. I told my GP it was not cold, but something's not quite right. This must have been about 10 in the morning. I was given an appointment for later that morning. I was feeling more and more anxious than I left the room, leaving my mother-in-law with Alfie and Amberley. With that, my son Alfie fell and cut his head. I said to my mother-in-law, call an ambulance. Then I took Alfie, sat him on the kitchen side and attended to his cut. I controlled the bleeding and asked my mother-in-law to cancel the call she was making for the ambulance. I knew that was drastic, calling the ambulance, and at any other time, that would not have been my first impulse. Anyhow, we left the house and put the kids in the car and went to A&E. I parked and it was raining as Amberley started crying in the car park. When I arrived, I booked Alfie in with the cup in his head and I booked Amberley in. When asked what for in regards to Amberley, I thought about what would get me seen and said breathing. Now, I think I only waited 15 to 20 minutes before I went through with Amberley. Just as well I had my mother-in-law with me as I could leave my son Alfie with her. Strange, I knew Alfie would be fine, and although Amberley was coming across as nothing quite wrong, I just felt it. Now, the first nurse I see made me upset, as when she could not find Amberley's pulses, she got agitated. But before long, another nurse arrived. Now, she asked me some questions. Then Amberley and I were moved to a cubicle. From here, Amberley was given oxygen, and I was told she had an infection. I asked if I could hold my baby, as as soon as that oxygen mask went on her face, she became so agitated. It was upsetting, but I understood they had to do their job. Then things became unclear. I was moved again, which later I found out was Risa. I was left here. Now I remember that morning I'd left in such a hurry, I never had the baby bag, and all I wanted was a nappy to change Amberley and her blanket to put over her. Now I realise I went from being told my daughter had an infection, being moved to recess and having no one. Then there was a rush of paediatrician, doctors and nurses. I stayed calm and asked what was going on. I was told my daughter was critically ill and will be transferred to Great Ormond Street. During this time, a number of other doctors arrived. I called my husband in South Africa to inform him of what was going on and that we were going to be transferred to Great Ormond Street. Now, this one paediatrician in charge of Amberley's case stood out. He came in and asked his staff to get equipment, and Amberley was soon under a heater. But then, as they undressed Amberley, I was asked by one of the lady doctors, did you know your baby is blue? Well, I knew this was serious the whole time, and I watched as they all frantically rushed around me. This same lady doctor began to shave Amberley's head until the paediatrician said, what are you doing? In this time, only one nurse stood out from the rest and offered me support. Amberley was then diagnosed as a blue baby. I was told that there was a gentleman in the hospital from the Royal Brompton who would be down to scan Amberley's heart. With this, I called my husband again, asked the paediatrician to speak to my husband and bring him up to date. I then asked for my husband to book a flight home. Amberley's heart was scanned. Now I knew what was wrong with my daughter and all I had to do was wait for the CATS team to transfer Amberley to the Brompton. 
The Cats team were amazing. They told the team at Barnet they would take over from here and use all their own equipment. They were very assertive. During this time, the Cats team asked me to come and stand with my baby. Amberley arrested at Barnet, but we was revived and transferred to the Brompton. In entering the Brompton, I was taken to a relative room. You know, straight away I had a member of staff talk me through what was going on. I said, I just want to understand what is going on and will you be able to help Amberley? You know what she said? This is our bread and butter. I thought, thanks for that. I am in the right place. I was then taken to a room with my dad my dad, as Mark was still on his way back from South Africa. We were told Amberley would need an operation, and this was explained extremely well. I understood I had to go ahead with this straight away. There was no way I could wait for my husband. I signed the papers, and Amberley was taken to surgery. Thanks to the surgeon, he did all that he could. Amberley came out of surgery and was treated amazingly with such care and survived until her daddy arrived home from South Africa Wednesday morning. I knew something was up, mother's intuition. I didn't like how events took place at Barnet, but I hope they learned a lot from Amberley. But I will say thanks to the staff there who did all their jobs to the best of their ability. I'd like to say thanks to the Cats team, who knew exactly what they were doing, and thanks to the Brompton, who bring me to tears at how good they are. My granddad said, angels in uniform. I agree. Louise Hanrahan, who wanted to share her story to help improve awareness of duck-dependent lesions. Meredith Allen, paediatric consultant at the Brompton, explains how Amberley's case shows we can do better. I think we're a long way from doing the best we can. We only nationally are picking up about 30% of the critical duct-dependent lesions antenatally. And so that leaves 70% of the children being diagnosed after they're born. Of those, we're still picking up less than 50% before they leave hospital. We're only picking up about 45% um, before they leave hospital. So that means 55% of the children are leaving hospital and they will only present when they become sick. And so essentially that means every year we're going to have about 400 135 children just like Amberley who are waiting until they get sick before they come to medical attention and the question is if we can pick them up earlier we know they do better they do better because they deal with their operation better they're not so sick before they go in they're better when they come through the recovery period and we protect their vital organs particularly their brain much better if we pick them up early um, and hopefully we avoid the deaths like Amberley. How can we improve what can we do? I think the first thing we need to do is raise awareness, which is what today is about. You know, we need to really raise awareness in the frontline staff, the people who are seeing these children first and the parents. They need to know that heart is an option and that it may be the child's heart, which is the reason that they're not quite right. And then after that, we need to make sure that when they do come into medical attention, that people think about the heart and they examine these children really carefully. We need to make sure that they, you know, listen to the heart, they feel those pulses, they take a saturation measurement. And if they're not sure, they move the child to somewhere where we can be sure because we can make the diagnosis we don't want the community to make the diagnosis we just want them to think about it and bring the child to us and then we can look at their heart properly and if if the child's fine it doesn't matter it doesn't cost us anything to have a quick look and then send the child back out again and we'd rather do that than miss one amberley um, so I think we can do it better and most of all if we really really want to make a difference then we have to improve our antenatal scanning because that's what makes the big difference to outcomes. It helps with our ability to counsel the parents, to deliver the child safely, to transport this child safely and for the child then to be cared for in a controlled and safe way before they get sick. We've got the opportunity in this country to roll out a real national program where we can improve our fetal scanning. And I think, unlike lots of other countries, we can do it a lot better and we can show real results and real improvements and we can stop our children dying. That was Meredith Allen on the improvements we can still make to our fetal scanning and treatment of duct-dependent lesions and how we have the opportunity to lead the world in neonatal healthcare. Myocarditis is infection of the heart muscle. It's not exclusively a disease of babies, but this causes a number of complications, not least that the baby cannot communicate the symptoms. To find out more about the disease, I spoke to Mary Montgomery, consultant paediatric intensivist working with the Children's Acute Transport Service, or CATS. Viral myocarditis is an infection of the heart muscle caused by a virus. There are a few viruses that much more commonly cause this, of which the enterovirus is an adenovirus, the most common. 
And these are viruses that would normally cause just a, a mild illness in a, an older child or an adult, maybe a cold, maybe a little bit of an upset stomach. But in a newborn baby, it can be devastating to the heart, causing inflammation and poor function of the heart muscle, such that the heart can't pump blood around the body and the baby becomes very unwell. And the baby can contract it, in fact, even before it's born. It doesn't have to be exposed to these viruses in the air. That's true. If a mum has a viral infection with adenovirus or enterovirus um, prior to the baby being born, usually um, relatively close to the birth itself, then the baby can be born having already contracted this virus. It's not common... But yes, it can happen. And then the other periods of vulnerability are soon after the baby's born, either from mum because she has a cold or something like that, or from relatives who have been unwell with a cold or, as I say, an upset stomach or something like that. And as it's an infection of the heart tissue, I assume that although in us as adults the symptoms would be a bit of a headache, feeling a bit bunged up, I'm assuming that because it's a different tissue it infects, it means the symptoms are very different. That's true. Um, Adults can also have viral myocarditis. So an adult who has a viral myocarditis would have a, let's say, a a cold which then doesn't get better. And then feelings of tiredness, dizziness, palpitations perhaps, uh, and feeling very weak. And you then have to translate, I suppose, those symptoms into what a baby might uh, be feeling. They can't tell you. So then that's for us to look out for those signs. And in a baby, the signs of that sort of problem would be a baby who's sleeping a lot, uh, an unusually good baby, or um, a baby who doesn't seem to be able to feed very well. A baby who becomes irritable. Um, Irritability in a baby is often a sign of pain. And if your heart's not working very well, you can get cardiac pain a baby can't tell you that they might just be irritable Mm -hmm. maybe vomiting sometimes diarrhea because the guts aren't working very well might be other things very cold hands and feet you might see as well so these symptoms are are relatively general taken all together then you can clearly see that there's something very important and very worrying but if it's a baby that is just quite sleepy or doesn't feed particularly well there's all sorts of other things it could be that's absolutely true. Myocarditis, viral myocarditis is just one in a large spectrum of diseases that a, a baby who's not well could have. What I would wish for is that it actually goes into people's thoughts when they're looking at a sick baby, that it's not always a bacterial infection, a meningitis, a bronchiolitis, that myocarditis is it needs to be in there in the diagnostic bag so that when people are examining babies looking at babies listening to parents about the fact that something's not right that they simply think about it because if you think about it you will look out for those particular features that might point you slightly more in the direction of viral myocarditis as opposed to something else once it is diagnosed what are our treatment options Treatment options can vary depending on the severity of the disease. So viral myocarditis could be a mild self-limiting disease, which we may never diagnose, or it can cause death of a, of a baby. So there's a spectrum in between. What we can do in the meantime, actually, there's very little specific treatment. So there's nothing particular that we have in our armoury that's going to make it better, but we can support babies. Now, that may mean that we're supporting them with drugs that they can take by mouth uh, to help the heart, to help them get as much function out of the heart as they can. Or it may be that we're actually helping them with their breathing because breathing takes a lot of work. And if we help them with their breathing, the heart doesn't have to do that. That rests the heart. Or actually giving them drugs through the veins to help their hearts. All the way through to um, putting them on a heart-lung machine either to rest the heart and wait for it to recover or very occasionally we're able to transplant these babies if the heart doesn't recover. So it sounds like early diagnosis is incredibly important. It is, because late diagnosis means that the baby's likely to die. So late diagnosis of severe viral myocarditis is is one which it fills me with fear as a a clinician because I know that the chance of me being able to transfer that baby to a a tertiary centre where they can get the sort of high-level support is, is almost non-existent. And so late diagnosis is something associated with very severe morbidity and and a higher mortality. Early diagnosis is key. Early identification is an advantage in all illnesses, but becomes very tricky when the patient can't report their own symptoms. Heart conditions like myocarditis are thankfully rare, but often the symptoms can be misdiagnosed. Christine Stacey joined us to share the story of her son, Tom. 
Tom was born at 40 weeks, um, von Toos, normal delivery. He was born at a good weight, had an easy pregnancy. He fed really well in the delivery room, so all was looking as if everything was fine. I was quite keen to leave the hospital quickly because... I'd had a really traumatic birth experience and because I was a second-time mum and the ward's very busy, the midwives were quite happy for me to go quite soon and, in fact, I left hospital before feeding was properly established. I saw midwives in the community over the next five days. Tom had all the normal neonatal checks and everything was fine. He was a slow feeder. He was different to my first child, who's two now. Um, He didn't cry very much and he slept a lot. On day five, he had a heel prick test and the midwife was unable to get very much blood from his heel, which I thought was odd. The next day, we took him out just in the car and I noticed that he looked a funny colour. So I phoned the midwife unit and they said that it sounded like he had jaundice and that we should let him sleep in the conservatory. Then, basically, day seven, he looked even worse and I took him to the midwife unit and they felt that he was fine. On day eight, he collapsed at home. His temperature was very, very low um, and he was having difficulties breathing. We got him to hospital only just in time. They resuscitated him. He was transferred to St Mary's Hospital, thinking it was a generalised infection. He was then sent to Brompton because they decided there was a heart problem. Eventually, on Christmas Eve, he was diagnosed with enterovirus myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle due to infection, viral infection. He was then transferred to Leicester because his heart function had deteriorated and was having funny rhythms. Over the next 10 days, his organs deteriorated, his heart deteriorated, and he became more and more unstable, and eventually a transplant was seen as the only option. Very, very bad option because the likelihood of getting an organ in the time frame he had was very, very slim and unlikely. After 10 days, he did get a donor heart, although there was question over whether he'd survive the operation because he was in end-stage multi-organ failure. He did survive the operation, and he survived the post-operative period. Then his recovery was very slow and complicated. He was ventilated dependent for another 12 weeks. His other organs took a very long time to recover, particularly his liver. And eventually he came home on the 16th of April, and since he's come home, he's done really, really well and he goes back to Great Ormond Street once every six weeks. His quality of life is excellent, and he's, he's doing really well now. Clearly a very traumatic story. What do you think were the, the sort of key lessons that you learned? What can we share to help people not have to go through your experiences? I think the two key things are that when a mum or a dad worries, their worries should always be taken seriously. Um, for us, being told that we were panicky, really coloured our response when we really needed to act very quickly and we only just got him to culture to hospital in time. We didn't call an ambulance and I regret that and I think if I hadn't had the urge to not appear to be panicky, I would have just called an ambulance because by the time we got to Kojda, he had deteriorated quite significantly. The second thing is the overwhelming feeling I got was that if you've got one baby that's healthy and fine you're going to have another one that's healthy and fine and what I learned from Great Ormond Street and the Brompton is that actually second babies get sick too. It's a very brave thing to come and tell this story on stage in front of all these people. Why did you decide to do this? We couldn't say no. The Brompton, the Cats team, all of the hospitals, all of the hundreds of people involved in Tom's care did so much for him and so much for us it was the worst experience of our life but they made it manageable so many of the doctors and nurses in fact we said all of the doctors and nurses treated him like he was their own son they really really cared for him and they really cared about him not just as a patient but as Tom and the opportunity to just do something tiny to help contribute to a day or a week is just something so little for us we're just thankful that we can do something to give something back and hopefully stop it happening to somebody else. Christine Stacey telling the story of her son Tom, who is now recovering well, but could have had a much easier life if myocarditis had been identified earlier. Arrhythmia, or an abnormal heartbeat, is often something we associate with grandparents rather than newborns, and although terrifying, it's seen as controllable. But once again, the fact that a baby can't tell you how it feels, along with the relative rarity, means that arrhythmia is a much more serious condition for babies. 
Consultant electrophysiologists Dominic Abrahams from Great Ormond Street and St Bartholomew's Hospitals and Jan Till from the Brompton explain more. Well, an arrhythmia is a rhythm disturbance of the normal heart rhythm. So we lose the normal conduction from the top right-hand corner through the top chambers of the heart and then through the middle of the specialised conducting bundles in the heart and then down to the bottom chambers of the heart. So the heart is designed to beat in a nice, smooth, coordinated way. And really all an arrhythmia means is loss of that nice, smooth sequence. And this can come in many, many forms. And the sort of two main ones I discussed were fast heart rhythms, which we usually refer to as arrhythmias. And those are the first group mediated by an extra pathway in the heart, which is just a strip of muscle between the top and the bottom chambers of the heart, usually around one of the two valves in the middle of the heart. What that does is it causes an extra connection between the top and the bottom of the heart. So we normally only have one. With that muscle strip, we now have two. And that allows the electrical activity to go down one and back up the other. So it creates a circuit within the heart, and uh, the electrical impulse just gets stuck on that. It's a bit akin to a car being stuck on a roundabout, and it will just go round and round and round very, very fast. So rather than the usual beat, pause, beat, you end up with a system with no pauses in between and extremely rapid heartbeats. Exactly right. So the heart rate in a baby, for example, normally will be between 120 and 140 beats a minute. But in these, what we call SVTs, these fast arrhythmias, it can be up to 260 beats a minute. And it's just incessant. It can carry on and continue and continue. And of course, that's why these babies become so sick, because the heart is just the muscle. You make it beat twice as fast as it should. Ultimately, it gets tired and fails. And does it have to be a a physical change, something physically different in the heart to lead to an arrhythmia? Not always. I mean, that's the vast majority. 90% of the arrhythmias we see in young children will be mediated via a pathway as we just described. One of the other rhythms, problems that we see in the heart is called atrial flutter, which again occurs in the normal heart. And classically, we associate it in adult heart disease. People in their 50s and 60s will get this arrhythmia. And this is where the uh, electrical impulse again is stuck, but it's just going round and round within the right atrium, which is the top right-hand corner, um, top right-hand chamber of the heart. Why this happens in babies, we don't know, but it does. It's quite unique to this particular age group. And often once you've stopped it, it never comes back. So we don't know quite why it starts. Jan, talking of arrhythmias in babies, how do we first see these? What are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms and signs of an arrhythmia in this age group are very, very difficult to detect. They're not specific. So uh, when an older person gets an arrhythmia, they can come to you and tell you, I have palpitations or my heart is going fast or my heart is racing. Of course, in this age group, they can't communicate. And so you have to pick up on the rather nonspecific signs that uh, having such a fast heart rate causes. So the usual signs are that the baby becomes a bit cool around the edges, the cardiac output is limited and therefore um, toes and fingers become cool. The baby is a bit irritable, doesn't want to sleep. The baby can't feed. And then as the uh, arrhythmia goes on for a longer period of time, the baby goes into heart failure. And so the baby starts uh, breathing more rapidly and loses their lovely usual pink colour, so they become a bit grey and cold around the edges. And what options do we have for treating them? We have a lot of options, um, as long as uh, it's picked up early and and it gets to a cardiac centre. The problem is that delay uh, in recognition. It's not surprising there's a delay because these things are very unusual in the general scheme of things. So no one's thinking of SVT. The signs and symptoms, as I've said, are very difficult to detect. And so often uh, we're presented with a baby who's been in an arrhythmia for three or four days before they get to us. Once they get to us, we've got um, a number of options. We have vagal manoeuvres, intravenous drugs we can give, and we can do DC cardioversion where we electrically restore the rhythm. So we give the patient a very brief shock, usually under an anaesthetic, and the heart resets to a normal rhythm. It's very safe and very effective. And if they remain untreated, what's the prognosis? How long would an infant with an arrhythmia survive without being seen and treated? 
Well, it's slightly variable, but after a, uh, about three or four days, the heart really fails, and so unfortunately you then would lose a baby, um, a baby who has the potential to have a completely normal life if you can get there in time. So the message really is identify it early and treat quickly. Absolutely correct, yes. <laughs> So what do you think the importance is of events like this, where we get to talk about these sorts of illnesses? I think the most important thing is to get SVT on people's radar. The vast majority of people, as Jan just explained, will only see SVT two or three times in their life as a practising physician, be it as a a GP in paediatrics or a midwife or a nurse. So it's not something that people think about on a regular basis. Of course, it's much more common in adults, so people think about it more readily. But in children, it's just important to let people know it exists. And what we've tried to do today is provide some very simple guidelines to say, you know, do think of the heart. I think we tend to think of infection. We tend to think of all sorts of other things. And some of the things we screen for are actually incredibly rare, whereas the cardiac problems are much more common. So I think it's just making people aware that it exists. We don't expect them to make a diagnosis. We don't expect them to treat it. But just to think of it and give us a call. It's very easy to do an ECG. You can fax it and you can get an answer straight away. So these are things that we're... This this is the message we're trying to get across today. Dominic Abrahams and Jan Till on the importance of thinking about the possibility of arrhythmia when examining an unwell baby. We were also joined by Rick and Helen Upchurch, who, despite it being very painful to recollect, shared the story of their son, Joseph, who was born with atrial flutter. Rick and Helen came very close to losing Joseph, so I asked them if they thought, despite the tears, that it was important to share his story. Yeah, absolutely. I think we were so keen to do anything that would help the Brompton after what they did for us that you know they, asked, they advised us that they were going to be doing this topic. And we said straight away, absolutely, if, if it will help, then we'll do whatever we have to. And no matter how hard it is to relive all of that and go through it all again, if it helps them help more babies, then we just considered that we had to do it. Yeah, no, I just uh, wish I could have delivered it without, <laughs> without the tears and all that, but uh, without the emotion. But um, mm-hmm. if there's even just a few little, little things that we've inadvertently said that... Somebody thinks, oh, yeah, that's useful, then and wacko, that's what we need. <laughs> Rick and Helen Upchurch explaining how sharing one of the most traumatic moments of their lives will be worth it if it helps just one family to avoid going through their experience. So the whole event was an emotional one, highlighting the need for more awareness, increased testing and understanding of neonatal heart conditions. Above all, the commitment and compassion shown by the staff of all of the hospitals involved shone through. Susie Lishman again. I mean, we've had a wonderfully diverse range of speakers today, from experts, people really at the um, front line of looking after these babies when they're first rushed into hospital, um, uh, through people who look after them in the longer term. And I found certainly the most, the most moving with the parents who came in to tell their stories. And so it's just given a really good overview of what can happen with very young babies. And I think the big message that struck me was that mums who are worried that there's something not quite right about their babies should really be listened to. Mothers know their babies best and they shouldn't be disregarded as panicky or paranoid parents. And that if the mum thinks something's wrong, then it's really worth looking into it in more detail. That's all from this National Pathology Week podcast. Do please check out the others in this series where we're exploring the process of getting a new heart, the art and ethics of modern healthcare and the anatomy of a heart attack. You can find out more about National Pathology Week online at nationalpathologyweek.org. That's all one word. And you can visit the Royal College of Pathologists online at rcpath.org. I'm Ben Valsler from thenakedscientists.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>